And the buds invite us into spring and the season of Lent. Our prayer for illumination. God of fig trees and foxes, of today and tomorrow, we would like to ask you, scoop us up. Pick us up like a great gust of wind. Startle us, awake, like a first love. Light a fire in us like tomorrow depends on today. Do all of this to get our attention and then turn us toward you. We are a scattered people, God. The world is moving faster than we can keep up. So we pray, scoop us up, catch our eye, open our ears, capture our attention. We are here. We long to be close to you. Amen. There's this picture there. Tom Sam. Good morning. morning. And welcome to the worship of God here at Danville Congregational Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us here this morning. Got some feedback going on, Randy. We're also grateful for those that are worshiping with us online. So good to have you here with us today. We're an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. We're a people of extravagant welcome, no matter what you feel like, think like, move like, sing like, dance like, dress like, vote like, love like, you are welcome here, and indeed, we're glad you're here with us. If you're new to our community, um, 
We hope that we have an opportunity to say hi to you after the worship service. We'll be having some time for coffee and refreshments out on the patio. So please plan to join us out there so that we can greet you. And if you are worshiping with us online, um, we hope that you can hang out with us in the breakout rooms after worship to have some time with one another, with those that are worshiping with us virtually this morning. For our youngest ones that are with us in person, we have a children's library in the back with some activity bags. Um, if your kid would like a book for the service or an activity bag, you're welcome to go back there and, and grab one and bring it back to your seat. And if you'd like to take the book home with you, you can do that. Just, just bring it back here at the church whenever you finish it. Uh, later in the service, we'll have an opportunity to lift up our joys and concerns. For those that are gathered here in our sanctuary, uh, there are prayer cards in every pew, and you can uh, fill your joy or concern out on the prayer card. And if you're worshiping with us online, uh, you'll have an opportunity during our time of prayer to share your joy or concern in the chat feature. And John, our tech minister this morning, will uh, lift each intention up during that time. We have a couple announcements this morning. The first is that this morning is in Gathering Sunday when we receive perishable donations. Uh, so if you brought a per perishable donation with you, I believe there are baskets out in the narthex that you can drop your donation off uh, after the service. Uh, you're also invited to donate online through our online giving on our church website. And every month the Outreach Commission designates a different organization in the uh, wider area that they want to um, uh, direct money to. And this, this month, they're, they've chosen the Monument Crisis Center in Concord, uh, which is an organization that works with low-income families here in the county. So uh, if you'd like to give online for our In Gathering Sunday, you can do that today too. Speaking of giving, uh, next week, we'll be receiving our One Great Hour of Sharing offering. There's a flyer in your bulletin. Uh, this is an offering through the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Uh, it's one of five offerings that we participate in uh, every year uh, with the national setting. And so we hope that you give generously to One Great Hour of Sharing next week. Uh, we'll be receiving signups for our winter nights meals uh, with the San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church, uh, with whom we partner with, uh, after worship today. So if you would like to supply a dish for one of the nights that we're serving dinner, you can sign up with Stephanie uh, after worship. She has a clipboard, and she'll, she'll gladly take your name. If you'd like to serve the day of, you can do that too. And if you'd like to do both, we would gladly welcome that. So uh, we hope that you'll sign up after worship with Stephanie. And then Kathy Hickson has an announcement, and I'm going to use the yellow mic, Randy. A little history on DCC's Easter basket tradition. 35 years ago, DCC church member Chris Sonneman, a nurse at Kaiser Hospital in Walnut Creek, suggested that DCC provide Easter baskets to HIV AIDS patients. We directly delivered colorful and loaded food baskets to patients for a number of years. Subsequently, Danville Congregational Church provided Easter baskets to the Rainbow Community Center in Concord. Currently, our Easter baskets are delivered to Hope Solutions, an outreach community providing support services for families suffering challenging times. Today, we are taking signups at Coffee Time in Koenia for this year's baskets for delivery on April 15th. You may also sign up via Sign Up Genus listed in Thursday's church news or email, Kathy Hickson at comcast.net. Thank you. Friends, I think those are all the announcements that I have for you this morning. 
So let us center our hearts and our minds in this space of worship as we come together this morning to worship our abundant and gracious God. Let us join together in worship. All are invited to rise in body, mind, or spirit. Come, all who are thirsty. Come, all who are waiting. Come, all who need rest. Come, whether you are young or old, confident or curious, Lonely or hopeful. Let us worship holy God. Peace be with you. Let us greet one another with waves and smiles from where we are located. may be seated. There is something so healing, so life giving about telling our stories. In the prayer of confession, that is what we get to do. The mask comes off. Any pretense of perfection is removed. We let the pressure to perform, to be productive, to slip away, and we sit here face to face with God, sharing honestly who we long to be. Friends, there is healing here in this moment. There is life to be gained here in this moment. So join with me in this moment of honesty, 
join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, we treat our self-worth like something that can be bought at a store, but you know this even better than we do. Instead of trusting that we are made good, instead of trusting that we are loved exactly as we are, we stockpile our value in earthly things, in trophies and awards, in likes and follows, in wealth and power. Forgive us for creating our own measuring stick. Heal our open wounds and tell our hearts that we won't be forgotten if we slow down. We won't be forgotten if we rest. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Friends, take a deep breath. Release the tension in your jaw. There is good news here. For even when we stumble, even when we take the easy way out, even when we forget our own self-worth, even when we lose our way, we belong to God. Say it with me. We are loved. We are claimed. We are under God's wing. We are worthy of grace. We belong to God. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's time to have a little moment with our younger people. Want to sit? I did pull my mask down so, to make sure that you could understand me. Today, we're going to read a story. And for the adults, it's going to seem like we just read this story the other day, but it's actually been several years. Because um, time flies that way for the adults. But for the kids, it might be new for you, or maybe. Max and Serena, you've heard it before. It's a story called You Are Special by an author named Max Lucado, who writes lots of things. It's a very nice book. And I'm going to try to read it quickly and skip over some parts so we can get through this nice story. Okay. Just one second. This is a story about the Wemmicks. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. You can see it in that picture right there. Can you see that workshop up on the hill over the little town? Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats, but all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. All day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the streets all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Others, though, couldn't do very many things, and they got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around him and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't even want to go outside. Sometimes he had so many gray dots that people would just come up and give him one for no reason at all. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. And after a while, Punchinello started believing them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. A few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks who had a lot of dots. 
Then one day he met a Wemmick who was unlike any other Wemmick he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. And others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay on either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anybody's marks on me. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. Puntinello sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around giving each other stars and dots. That's not right, he muttered to himself, and he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here, and he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello? The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little Wemmick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wemmicks just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me, special? Why? I can't walk fast. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on the small wooden shoulders and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know, she told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? Because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers stick on you only if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand, said Punchinello. You will, but it will take some time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care about you. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as the Wemmick walked out the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart, he thought, I think he really means it. And when he thought that, a dot fell to the ground off of his body. That's our story for today about Punchinello and the Wemmicks. So for just one minute, I know that took several minutes, but I want you to imagine what it feels like to know deep inside you with 100% certainty that there's nothing else that you need to do or say or become to deserve God's love. It's always here for you at every moment. Feels pretty good. Okay, let's pray. Father, Mother, God, thank you for this day. And thank you for helping me see that you love me no matter what.
Our scripture lesson for today, the third Sunday of Lent, is from the Gospel of Jesus according to Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Hear these words. At that time, at that very time, there were some present who told him about the, Gal about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will, per you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. May God illuminate our understanding of these ancient words. Amen. Friends, will you join me in a moment of prayer? Spirit of the living God, Paul of prayer. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable to you. For you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. In the television show, Parenthood, there is a boy named Max. And Max has Asperger's syndrome, which means he doesn't always know how to interact with the world. He can have behaviors that seem a little odd and out of place to those that are around him. In a particular episode, Max has just started middle school and all summer, the only thing that Max could think about and that he was really excited about was that once he got to middle school, there would be a vending machine with Skittles. As soon as school started, Max would be able to get Skittles anytime that he wanted throughout the day. But that first day of school, when Max arrives, the vending machine is missing. It had been removed over the summer. No more vending machines, no more Skittles. And right then and there, Max loses it. He gets angry. He gets loud. He starts hitting his backpack against the ground and shouts, it's not fair. It's not fair. For years, all these students have had a vending machine, but I get here and it's gone. It's not fair. Once at home, Max is still very upset. He talks to his dad and he keeps saying it isn't fair. It isn't fair. Little did Max know that same day, his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And his dad, knowing more than Max, looks at him with a tear in his eye and a lump in his throat. And all he can say is, 
I know Max. It isn't fair. If you have ever wondered if we, the people of today, share something in common with the people of the Bible, then today's gospel text settles it. We both know the pain and questions that come as we endure the tragedies of life. For the people of the text, the tragedy was a recent attack on a synagogue in Galilee where Pontius Pilate killed the worshipers as they were making sacrifices in their temple. But there had been another tragedy too. A tower had fallen over, taking the lives of 18 innocent people. Tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, the people of the story, Jesus's people, they too must have had newspapers and headlines that always carried tragic news. I think we know what that's like. For the past four weeks, we have witnessed the tragedy of war and violence unfold in Ukraine. This week, we heard about homeless people in Washington, D.C. and New York City being shot up and murdered because someone thought that they are unworthy. And here at home, I've learned of a couple people that have received medical diagnoses that are life-changing, life-altering. Sure, you have people in your own lives, in your own communities, with their own tragedies. We too are no strangers of pain and sadness. Tragedy after tragedy, they are everywhere. They are timeless. It seems that we are all just living on borrowed time. In the ancient world, the common belief was that when bad things happened, they only happened to bad people. Those deserved it. It was a worldview that meant if you got cancer, then you deserve it. You must have done something bad enough for God to punish you in this way. A woman gave birth to a child with a disability. Well, that must have meant that she or her father did something bad at one point in their life. Now, this may have been an ancient worldview but it still lingers around today. We often wonder if we get what we deserve. A woman makes the decision to terminate a pregnancy. Now she's come to learn that she can no longer get pregnant and she thinks I'm being punished. I'm getting what I deserve. This is why Jesus' followers are so frightened in the gospel text this morning. They too are wondering if these Galileans are being punished. They had done something to deserve being killed by Pilate. They were wondering if those 18 poor innocent people that were crushed by a falling tower had somehow in some way done something to deserve that. So is that how life works? Is that how the world works? Do we get what we deserve? I think it's a question we all ask. And finally, finally, for once, Jesus gives a clear answer. No. Is this how the world works? No. Do we get what we deserve? No. Which is good news. It means that whatever tra tragedy strikes next in your life, you don't have to waste your time worrying if somehow you could have done something different so that you wouldn't deserve it. You didn't. 
You didn't deserve it. That's not how God works, Jesus says. But then Jesus goes on, and this is where the road gets a little bumpy. No, he says, but unless you repent, you will perish like they did. Great. We were so close to a clear answer for once. That's not how Jesus works. Clear answers. Repent. It's not a word that we're typically fond of, is it? It's a word that just sounds so angry and written with guilt. Repent. It's a word that is with feelings of remorse. Whenever someone says we're supposed to repent for our sins, I always think it seems I'm supposed to feel really bad about something. Regret what I did and say that I'm sorry. And you know, I kind of have to really mean it, right? But repent is one of those words that has become distorted. To repent isn't to feel bad. It isn't to say, I'm sorry. It isn't to feel guilty. To repent means to change, to turn around, to stop doing what you are currently doing that is destructive to your life. It's not about feeling bad. Feeling bad doesn't do anyone any good. It's about changing. It is a complete reconfiguration of how you behave and how you think. Jesus says, change your understanding of how God works. God doesn't punish bad people and reward good people. Jesus declares that there is innocent suffering in this world. So change, he says. Change your understanding and accept that there can be innocent suffering. But if you don't change, you too will perish, Jesus says. Why? Because you'll just continue to worry about yourself all the time. You'll only want to make sure you never do something that might bring punishment to you. And then when something painful does come along in your life, you'll spend the whole time worrying about what you've done to deserve it. Jesus cast out fear, and today he wants to cast out the fear that we always get what we deserve. No, he says. Sometimes this world brings things, awful things, into our lives that we do not deserve. Life is simply not fair. And then, as if that weren't enough, Jesus gives them a parable. Now remember, a parable is like a riddle. It is a story whose meaning is not immediately obvious. You have to think and think and think about it before you might make any sense out of it. So Jesus tells them a parable, a story. There was a gardener who planted a fig tree, tended to it, cared for it, watered it for three years. But after three years, there was still no fruit, as would have been expected by any other fig tree. Then along comes the landowner, who tells the gardener to cut it down the fair thing to do. The tree has had three years. But the gardener replies to the vineyard owner and says, please, one more year. Let me tend it one more year. Let me dig a moat around it to make sure it has enough to drink. Let me put manure around it to make sure it has enough to eat. And then, if it hasn't given any fruit, we will cut it down. 
That is the story. But let's be honest, that is no ending. What happens to the tree? Right? We're left to wonder. I guess it's up to us to decide the ending. Now, there is a traditional way to read and interpret this parable. We are the tree and we're not producing enough fruit. It's a very American way of understanding this text. We aren't producing enough. We aren't accomplishing enough. We aren't doing what we're meant to do and God, the owner of the land, and therefore the owner of us is an angry God. And what does God want to do? God wants to grab an ax and chop us down because we are good for nothing and unworthy. But Jesus, the gardener, steps in and asks for one more year. One more year to nurture us and to care for us. It's this nice, soft, sweet Jesus taking care of us and protecting us from that mean old angry God. Now, I don't like that interpretation. I don't like it, but I'm gonna go with a different one. It sounds too much like the old way of thinking that Jesus just argued against before the parable was told. For God wants to give you what you deserve. The tree didn't produce any fruit, therefore God wants to chop it down. But remember, earlier in the text, Jesus has said no to that thinking. That's not how it works. That's not how God works. And in fact, Jesus has just told the people to repent, which means to change. Change your way of thinking. Change your way of seeing. So maybe we should ask who, who in the parable is being asked to change? It isn't the tree. I mean, the tree doesn't seem to have much control over the situation, right? It doesn't have much control over the fact whether it's producing fruit or not. It needs to be cared for by the gardener more before it can actually change and produce fruit. And the gardener isn't asked to change either. Who needs to change? The landowner. The landowner needs to change. How? How does this landowner change? By putting down the ax. The gardener is asked for another year with the tree to make sure it gets enough to drink, to feed the soil around it and to fertilize it. The gardener asks the landowner to turn around and put the ax back in the shed for one more year, at least. Friends, what if the landowner, the one with the ax in the hand, isn't God? What if the landowner is us? Maybe we've come across people and places in this world that just seem like they are good for nothing. They are a waste of space, sucking up all the resources of the earth and not producing a dang thing. And so they are not worthy of another year. Or maybe when you look in the mirror and see the reflection of yourself, you think you are good for nothing. Your inner critic comes out and becomes the dominant voice in your head and you think you are a waste of space. You are unworthy. The painful truth in this life is that life is not fair and we are all living on borrowed time. And so the question becomes, what will we do with that precious time? Will we continue to reach for that ax and cut down and away all the things and people in this world that we have deemed no longer worthy, including yourself? 
Or will we put down the axe and trust God that the gardener will go to work in those fruitless places? Will we stop looking upon those who are hurting as people who somehow deserve it and instead look upon them as beloved trees in God's garden who are worthy of another year? But we stop looking at ourselves, allowing the voice of the inner critic to tell us we get what we deserve, and instead offer ourselves the grace of God, that tender love and care, and say we are worthy of so much more. Put down the axe, Jesus says. Put down that blade that you are about to swing at the trunk of your own life or the life of another. And instead, maybe with those empty hands of yours, grab a pair of gloves and a bag of manure and get to work. God, the gardener in that fruitless tree, could use your hand. Thanks be to God. Amen.
come now to our time of prayer, where we are invited to lift up the joys and concerns of the people of God. So if you have a joy or concern this morning on a prayer card, you're invited just to raise it high for one of the ushers to collect. And if you are online with us, you're invited to share your joy or concern in the chat feature. After each petition is read, you're invited to respond with hear our prayer. Today we offer prayers for Steve and Heidi Bridgman. Steve Bridgman's father passed away on Tuesday of this past week, and Steve and Heidi have gone back to Denver to be with Steve's family. God, in your mercy. Barb DeBarger offers prayers for Nicole Noga who was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and will undergo surgery this upcoming week. We pray for her and her family, that they get the, that they get the comfort they need and the reassurance during this process. And for her doctors, that they skillfully remove all traces of this awful disease. God, in your healing and comfort. Let us join together to pray for the survival of Ukraine. Bless these Ukrainians as they fight for peace and freedom. Give them strength, bless their determination. Help those of us supporting them to find ways to ease their many burdens. Oh God, in your mercy. And Bremer offers prayers of joy for the birth of a good friend's first child. Ophelia was born on Thursday and mom and baby are both healthy and doing well. God, in your great joy and love. Richard and Diane's son, Eric, offers prayers of gratitude for this congregation. Visiting via Zoom from hundreds of miles away has been an important part of the week for two years now. And being here in person with my amazing family is a birthday wish come true. Happy birthday. God in your great love and Chris Rowan offers prayers of healing and comfort for a childhood friend, Michael Parsons, whose wife passed away last month. God in your healing and comfort. Nancy Dowell offers prayers to thee for Steve and Heidi. God in your great mercy. Jen and Gilbert offer prayers of healing and peace for our dear friends, Alex and Angie Seminario, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Who lost their beautiful three-year-old daughter just before her fourth birthday, three years ago today. God, in your mercy and peace. John, do we have any prayers from online? Uh, I'd like to offer one. Uh, this is a prayer for, um, healing and comfort for Donnie Wu. Donnie had uh, successful surgery on one of his carotid arteries and is due to have the second one operated on. God in your mercy. And that's all the online prayers I have. Thank you, John. Friends, let us join together in a spirit of prayer. God, sometimes we fail. Our very bodies fail as they are so fragile. How often have we wondered what to do and we choose the wrong action, words, or tone? As your collective people, oh God, we recognize that sometimes we fail those around us. We forget those around us in offering care as we try to talk about and pray for our global neighbors. Sometimes we fail at trying to make a difference. Our hearts fail and we break as we witness the atrocities 
in our earthly home. We fail when we look at ourselves in the mirror and think we are not worthy. With this utter brokenness, O oh God, we lift our hearts that they might be strengthened as you strengthen all your people. God of courage, while our bodies do not always have the strength to take action, we pray that your strength and your compassion might go to your people in this broken world as we continually pray for your children in Ukraine, we can't help but feel the brokenness in our own hearts as we see babies and young children and fragile lives being taken away from us too soon in the most horrible ways we could ever imagine. We witness Russia renew airstrikes in Kyiv we ask that you be there at a military training center in Western Ukraine, as near a boarding, boarding crossing between Ukraine and Poland, the deadliest westward attack has occurred. God, for those not in Ukraine, we simply cannot imagine what is happening to our siblings. Yet we pray and pray and pray as hard as possible praying for the three million refugees far away from family, homes, and places they love, for the unknown number of people who were mercilessly killed, for those left behind who simply do not know what to do next. Benevolent God, we also pray about the escalation of tensions worldwide with Russia and for the Russian people. We pray for those trapped with a leader who perpetuates hate, violence, and lies as they live in isolation, as their future lives remain unknown. God of compassion, we pray for the people experiencing anguish and violence. We see serial attacks against homeless people and Very bodies are broken, but we also know our bodies can do so much. We are grateful for all the little joys that hold us in times of grief, for a beautiful day, for blooming flowers, for smiles, for the laughter of children, for our neighbor who cares for us for the food we love and that nourishes us, for leaders who are trying to make a difference, for our sacred spaces both in and outside these walls, for the beauty of friendship, for all these things and so much more, we are so grateful, God, that there are things that lift our broken hearts and broken bodies. Give us strength, God, and please be strength for us in our whole world. It's in the name of the one who gives us our very strength, we pray. Our loving God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Eric, can I offer one more prayer? Sure. Prayer of thanksgiving for seven young people in Guatemala, the Quiche Highland, friends of families that we know, who elected two years ago to go to school because 
scholarship help that we provided. And five of those young people living in homes with dirt floors, no running water, a half hour journey to the nearest internet cafe. Five of those young people are continuing and three of them are going to the university this year. Thanks, Peter. God, in your great love and joy. God calls upon us to love one another as God loves us. Even as God has abundantly blessed us with good things, let us bless others through gifts that show we care. For those of you who have already made a gift by check or automated giving, we are grateful. If you would like to make a gift today, please leave it in the basket in the back of the sanctuary as you leave or give using our website. You shower us with your goodness every day, O oh God. With grateful hearts, we bring you these gifts. Transform them into outpourings of peace and justice to reconcile all peoples to one another and to you. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe that the God of the cosmos is at work here. We believe that God is fertilizing the soil. We believe that God is planting roots. We believe that God is growing fruit that is yet to be tasted. But until that promised day, when the fig tree stands tall and swords are beaten into plowshares, we believe. When our work does not bear fruit, God still loves us. When our soil grows dry and cracked, God still longs for us. When all seems hopeless here on earth, God holds hope for us. The God of the cosmos is at work here. We believe, help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
As you leave this place, may you be awestruck by the beauty of the world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you and for yourself. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all your living, in all your breathing, in all your being, May you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit, and may it change your life. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go in peace, full to the brim with God's grace. Amen. Thank you.